to leave a dry night with clear spells for most. And that's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome, this is Real Britain with me, Emily Carver, on your TV, radio and online. Now today we'll be discussing Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng's growth plan. He announced it yesterday and I want to get your thoughts on it. You've had, you know, you've had the night to mull it over. So do you think it was a budget for prosperity or a budget for the rich? The fracking ban also was lifted this week, but what are the chances of us actually doing anything on a meaningful scale? And the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, wants to get tough on woke police. But first, let's go to the news with Ray Addison. Thanks, Emily. One minute past two, here's the latest from the GB newsroom. The Labour leader is accusing the Chancellor of gambling the mortgages and finances of the British people with what he called casino economics. Sir Keir Starmer echoed claims made by the Institute of Fiscal Studies, which say the government's mini-budget puts government debt on an unsustainable rising path. That's something Kwasi Kwarteng denies. Chris Philp, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, told us the whole country will benefit. I think the real gamble would be maintaining levels of tax that are inappropriately high, which risk deterring investment, which risk disincentivising hard work and which risk driving individuals and companies out of the United Kingdom by having competitive tax rates. We're encouraging people to work, encouraging them to invest and encouraging people and businesses to locate here in the UK. Former Tory Health Secretary Stephen Dorrell, who defected to the Lib Dems, told GB News this budget takes the Tory party back to their beliefs of the early 1970s. One of the things that you have to deliver as a government is sound money. And my concern, my principal concern this week, is that it, the actions of the government are undermining the commitment to sound money, which was the essential bedrock of both the Thatcher and major administrations. Steve Reid is Shadow Secretary of State for Justice. He says the mini-budget does very little for working people. It looks to me like they've gone to the casino and they've, they've gambled the British economy and British people's um, household finances um, on a set of uncosted tax cuts that benefit the super wealthy but do very little to help anybody else. Well, the Labour Party has pledged to create a national care service, claiming 13% of care homes need improvement. 
ahead of the Labour conference, which starts tomorrow. The party says private equity firms are failing in their duties to residents. Plans for the service include improvements in pay, workers' rights and improved training. Now, drivers could be paying an extra £5 for a tank of petrol due to a fall in the value of the pound. Motoring organisation, the AA, says petrol prices would be at least nine pence per litre cheaper if the pound had maintained its mid-February value instead of dropping to a 37-year low. Drivers are being encouraged to shop around to find more competitive prices. The Home Secretary is telling police forces in England and Wales to prioritise what she's calling common sense policing over diversity and inclusion initiatives. In an open letter to police chiefs, Suella Braverman laid out key priorities in her crime-cutting agenda, saying culture and standards have to change. Ms Braverman says she's dismayed at the lack of confidence in the force and is determined to restore the public's trust. Now, GB News has seen evidence of thousands of people camped around Dunkirk and Calais waiting to cross the English Channel in small boats. It comes as another 656 made the journey in 15 inflatables on Friday, bringing the total number who've crossed so far this year to well over 32,000. GB News' Kent producer says thousands are gathering in makeshift camps, mainly Africans, Iranians and Iraqis. GB News has also been told that border force facilities at Dover Harbour are critically overloaded. Ukraine's president is urging his fellow countrymen, who are forced to fight for the Russian army, to sabotage it from within. Volodymyr Zelensky says people in parts of Ukraine which are being controlled by Moscow should resist any efforts to mobilise them to fight. However, if they do get conscripted, they should do everything they can to help their homeland. His address comes as the Kremlin launched so-called referendums yesterday aimed at annexing four occupied regions of Ukraine. If you still find yourself in the Russian army, sabotage any enemy activity. Send us any relevant information about occupiers, their bases, HQs, ammo caches, and with the first opportunity, move to our side. Do everything to save your life and free Ukraine. King Charles has been photographed with his red box for the very first time. The picture, which was taken last week, shows the king carrying out official government duties at Buckingham Palace. Red boxes hold papers from government ministers in the UK and the Commonwealth. And Roger Federer has bid farewell to professional tennis, bowing out with a doubles defeat at the O2 Arena in London. The 20-time Grand Slam champion teamed up with old rival Rafael Nadal for the Lever Cup match, but lost to an American pair. The Swiss player announced his plans to retire from the sport last week. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's get back to Real Britain with Emily Carver. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. So here's what's coming up on the show. Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng says his tax cuts aimed at boosting economic growth are fair for all, despite the highest earners gaining the most. Labour and some Tory MPs have said it was wrong to cut taxes for the wealthy during a cost of living crisis. I'll get to the bottom of whether or not this is a budget solely for the rich. Also, the ban on fracking in England has been lifted. Business and Energy Secretary Jacob Rees-Mogg says we all must use all available sources of fuel within the UK rather than just import them. After 3pm, we'll be asking when will we actually start fracking? And there are warnings that the EU must take Vladimir Putin's nuclear threats in the conflict in Ukraine seriously. But are they just empty threats from a leader who has lost the confidence of his own country? That's what we're talking about for the next hour. And for today's Solve the Palaver with me, Emily Carver, I'd love to know your thoughts on whether you're happy with the mini budget or is it a budget that will simply benefit the rich? Tweet me at GB News or you can email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can also watch us on YouTube and thank you very much for tuning in. We've got lots to come.
Well, we've all had a chance to sleep on yesterday morning's budget. It's certainly been divisive, a little bit of a shock to the establishment, that's for sure. We've got a government now that seems to be doing exactly what it says it's going to do, regardless of what the commentariat has to say. That means lower taxes, lower regulation and an unashamed go-for-growth mentality. That means ignoring the protests of the left, the economic establishment and the media. That means favouring growth over redistribution, ideology over optics. Trussonomics is clearly a far cry from the big statism of the past, but how has it played where you are? There was a lot in this not-so-mini-mini-budget, wasn't there? The government has reversed the national insurance rise, scrapped the corporation tax hike, abolished the additional rate of income tax, cut basic income tax rates, scrapped the banker's bonus cap imposed by the EU, made simplifying taxes a top priority for the Treasury and HMRC, put in place a 2.5% annual growth target, scrapped Solvency II rules, repealed IR35, cancelled the green levies on energy bills for two years, given fracking the green light, introduced sanctions to encourage people back into work and will issue new oil and gas licences and sunset EU regulations by December 2023. That's a lot to get stuck into. So, do sunlit uplands await? Or is this a budget by the rich for the rich? Is it right to borrow in the hope of economic growth? Or is it reckless? It's fair to say the reaction has been mixed and, as is so often the case in Britain, ever so slightly hysterical. Tory casino economics, immoral, class war, extreme, barbaric are just a few instant reactions I've seen from those on the left. Free marketeer Alistair Heath of The Telegraph, on the other hand, certainly has a spring in his step. In his words, at a stroke of a pen, Britain's competitiveness, its attractiveness to investors and top talent has been transformed. This is the same Alistair who only a month ago complained that basket case Britain is on the brink of collapse. So is he right? Has Kwasi Kwarteng, who stood up for a total of 25 minutes to deliver his not so mini mini budget, unlocked a brighter future for us all? When Rachel Reeves, the shadow chancellor, said the plan was a Tory admission of 12 years of economic failure, she wasn't wrong. The tax burden is higher than at any time since Clement Attlee's post-war socialist administration. Growth has remained stagnant and the answer to any environmental or social problem, be it climate change or obesity, has been to ban, nanny and regulate. The director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies says Kwarteng is not just gambling on a new strategy, he's betting the house. Whether the gamble will pay off remains to be seen, of course. Truss and Quasi have less than two years to prove themselves. Cells. What's for certain, though, is that there's now a clear dividing line in British politics. Do you vote Labour and get higher taxes, redistribution and risk lower growth? Or do you vote for a lower tax, red tape cutting Conservative Party in the hope that a rising tide lifts all boats? So, that's the question I'm posing to you today. Is this a brilliant budget or is it one that just benefits the rich? Now, Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng, of course, announced a raft of measures that I just mentioned. They were designed to also help people pay their energy bills and, at the same time, boost economic growth. So, how has this mini-budget affected all of you across the country? First of all, I'm going to go speak to fish and chip shop owner John Pagani to discuss what the Chancellor's announcements mean for small businesses. Hi, John. How are you? Hi there. Good afternoon, Emily. Nice to Lovely speak to you. Lovely to speak to you again. Now, a lot of small business people have said there wasn't much in there for them. Do you agree? Well, certainly. I mean, there's been every single help that has been put out there is appreciated. But there's been definitely a, a denial of the real issues, which the, when the money comes in, the VAT goes out. And unfortunately, whether you make a profit or don't make a profit, that tax has to be paid. And the 20% VAT tax for uh, on hospitality is just shocking. And nothing was done to address this. So, yeah, we're going to be paying less uh, corporation tax. It's staying at 19%. So we're paying not a cut, but the same going forward. It's not going to go up to 25%. But you've got to make profit to pay that tax. And before you make the profit, we've either got to die a death by increasing our prices, so putting our staff, our customers off, from coming in and buying our, our product, or do we sit with no profit and die slowly by just not being able to pay our bills at the end of the quarter? 
Yes, I've heard from, from others that it is VAT and business rates that would have really made a difference if those two were cut or if there was some kind of relief given to small businesses. Do you think the general direction, the general direction to more free enterprise, lower taxes, cutting red tape is a good one for small businesses? It absolutely is. And, you know, everybody wants to keep a little bit more of the money that they've earned at the end of the pay packet. The bottom line is how much you've got to spend and everybody wants more money. So I'm absolutely 100% behind them on that. And I think it's unfair to accuse the government of just doing this for rich people because, yes, the very top rate has come down so everybody pays the 40% that's above a certain amount. However, it's, they still pay a lot, it's 40%. Um, so, and they are the highest earners Anyway, so there's only maybe 500,000 of them, I believe, in, in the whole country that are paying that rate. So it's not really that much of a cut. It is significant for them, but I do believe that the, the um, overall look... Oh, he's gone. Well, it was a pleasure, as always, with John. That was John Pagani, owner of Café Royale in Anna. And I think he gave a pretty balanced view, to be honest. Um, and we're now going to be getting the perspective of you, our GB, views, GB News viewers. So we've got Christian Holiday, who joins me now on the show. Christian, what do you make of the budget, the mini budget? Uh, good afternoon, Emily. Yes, there's nothing, uh, nothing mini uh, about it, actually. I think it's more comprehensive than anyone thought. And to be honest, uh, I've, I've been waiting a long time for a proper conservative, dare I say it, uh, Thatcherite uh, budget to uh, get the economy going again. You can't tax yourself into prosperity. Unfortunately, that's uh, a message that Rishi Sunak didn't quite understand, unfortunately. So I think this is a, a very welcome change of direction for uh, the Conservative government. Uh, even in prosperous Guildford, people and businesses have been struggling for quite some time. Uh, and I know that there's a raft of measures here which will help everyone, not just uh, the very wealthy. Uh, the, the, those who work in the city in, in Guildford will no doubt be very welcome of the, uh, the, the lifting of the cap on bonuses. But you can't raise up the poor by dragging down the rich. I think if you can earn the money and pay your taxes, and spend it in the UK, that's got to be a good thing. Um, for, for everyone else, you've got the cut in uh, basic rate of income tax and the yeah. reversal of Sunak's uh, national insurance charge. So uh, all these things are very welcome and just sort of taking soundings from family and friends uh, around, the, around Guildford and further afield. Um, overall, it's uh, seen as a very welcome budget. Oh, well, there we go. A positive, positive view from you, Christian. Uh, yes, I agree. You know, you need to uh, you need to boost economic growth. And I think one of Boris Johnson's failures with that was that he was so obsessed with the optics uh, rather than getting on with the job of growing the economy. Thank you very much for joining us on the show, Christian. Thank you, Emily. That was Christian Holiday from Guildford, I believe. Um, now we're going straight to a young person. We'll have the opinion of Anna McGovern, who's with us now. She's a political commentator and I believe still a student, Anna, are you? Yes, I am. I'm in my final year. I imagine this budget has gone down like a lead balloon among the student uh, body. I actually think there are some positive aspects to it, though. And, you know, as a Conservative myself, I am so glad that they're finally taking a bit more of a radical approach in terms of their economic policy. Because I think, as you said, and I completely agree, I think Boris Johnson was so worried about the optics and, you know, how would this be received that actually very little was done. And I think we had like the highest tax rates in 70 years, which is absurd, especially for a Conservative government to be having that. So I think it's actually really good that they've implemented some things that are taking huge risks yes but actually in a cost of living crisis we have to do you know have to act and you know to maybe try new things to you know act radically and solve this for people but i think in terms of the stamp duty cut um i think it's actually quite a good thing you know it'll make it easier for people to buy a house in terms of you know if there's a recession the property value will drop um however i don't think it doesn't it doesn't tackle enough in terms of student accommodation. I think that's a really big thing because I think we have 40% of students from China who come in and they will pay for the student accommodation up front. And then for many students such as myself and other students who are, you know, starting their first or second year, getting their student accommodation sorted, um, this will leave them with worse student accommodation. Like I've seen them and there are some horror stories because, you know, students 
from China, for example, can pay up front and get the best student accommodation. But a lot of the housing is being targeted at that. And I think maybe if something was spoken about that, that would have been really good to have included. Yeah, Anna, I think one of the things that will be interesting is, do you think young people will buy into the growth is more important than redistribution narrative because we've grown up and I'm, you know, I'm 30 years old, so I'm still quite young. We've grown up with seeing most policies, most budgets seen through the lens of redistribution, i.e. how are the rich giving to the poor? And that's what these types of fiscal events should be about. This in instead is unashamedly pro-growth. They want to grow the pie and they believe that that will benefit all in the medium to long term. Do you think young people are going to buy that message? Well, I think the you know the low the lower bracket income tax. I wish that was more because you know uh, as a conservative as well, and I think for many people, you know, people want to keep more of their money. Um, I think many people had some complaints about you know the highest earners getting those um, tax cuts, but at the end of the day, that will increase the revenue, um, and it will mean that the more of that money can be spent, and it could be you know reinvested into small businesses when people buy things, um, and that will really benefit people on the you know in the longer term i think um so i think there are benefits to that as well i do agree though i think that narrative can be received by young people and i think this is because this is such a radical i think budget that has been proposed and put forward so i think it's definitely a case of see seeing how this you know affects the you know society and the economy overall and yes it's, it's certainly something that people can get stuck okay. into and it's angered yeah, people definitely. and excited people in equal measure. Anna, thank you very much for taking the time on your <laughs> Saturday afternoon to join us to give you the student view or your view as a political commentator. Now, finally, to break down the impact on the hospitality sector, which has taken, well, hit after hit throughout the pandemic and now with recession looming, uh, we'll get the view of the CEO of UK Hospitality, Kate Nichols. Kate, what are businesses telling you? Well, businesses are saying that they remain concerned about the cost of doing business. And while the overall direction of travel of the budget, the mini budget, uh, is welcome, cutting taxes, not imposing tax increases and looking at cutting regulation, that's going to all be coming through and feeding through into businesses in the coming year. Uh, and what most of the hospitality businesses are saying is that the cost of doing business now is still so high, despite the two imp input pieces that we had from the Chancellor this week, the energy uh, subsidy and also the NIC cut. Uh, both of those measures extremely welcome, but businesses still feeling in the hospitality sector that what they really need is an injection of support now. And while you've got thousands of businesses facing business failure, still having questions over viability and jobs still at risk, a question mark over whether some of the tax cuts that will push through for the coming year are the right priority to be doing. So our businesses, in keeping with your first guest who, who had a fish and chip shop, really wanting to see some additional support and a, a translation of the, the uh, Chancellor's commitment to a globally competitive tax regime to be fed through to business rates and VAT, where we are not globally competitive. We have the highest tax rate in the OECD. And how is footfall at the moment? Uh, we've been hearing, of course, about the cost of living crisis, people's wages being squeezed, people not potentially having the disposable income that they might have done only a few months ago. Um, how is that being reflected in people actually going to restaurants, bars, going out? Well, I think this is the big concern and it's why we were very pleased that the, the Chancellor, the Business Secretary and the PM all acknowledged that hospitality was a vulnerable sector that needed additional support. It's disappointing that we haven't got that additional support coming through yet because what we are seeing is higher costs, higher energy bills coming through from the beginning of this year and accelerating since March and footfall declining over the same period. So while we started to reopen and recover in January, we've seen a plateauing and we're only at 85% of normal footfall levels in hospitality businesses uh, that we would have seen pre-COVID. So the volume of customers not yet back, revenues remaining flat, but costs soaring. And that means that business viability in the middle intensely squeezed. And with the cost of living crisis coming through, we're fearful that we won't see customer footfall recovering anytime soon. So that's why that additional support, business rates relief and a VAT cut 
would have really given a shot in the arm to our businesses now to get them through the next six months to allow them to get back to economic growth. Just very quickly, just on the energy bills, of course, there's been a huge support package, package on those. Surely that is giving some confidence to business owners. It, it does give some support. Yes, it means that our bills are not quadrupling or going up even more. They are just going up, they're, they're doubling. So it's still quite an increase, the same as consumers. But our businesses have had those higher bills, three, four, five hundred percent increases going through since May. So they're carrying a very high cost burden. And while it's welcome, it is only going to last for six months. So we do need to urgently get additional support to this sector, which let's not forget, it's the third largest employer, employs 3.2 million people, generates a hundred £130 billion pounds of revenue and normally £40 billion pounds of tax. We need to make sure those businesses are protected so that we can grow and play our part in unleashing the potential of the economy. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you for taking the time out of your day. That was Kate Nichols, CEO of Hospitality UK there. Now, there's plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, I'll be speaking to Mike Neville, who's a former Met Detective Chief Inspector on Home Secretary Suella Braverman's efforts to stamp out wokery in the police. But first, let's have a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and there will be a scattering of showers across England and Wales, but drier further north. Here are the details. Starting in the southwest and across northern parts of Devon and Cornwall, there will still be a few showers around this evening, but further south, it's looking mostly dry. There may still be a few showers continuing throughout the afternoon in the southeast as well, but for many, it will be a fine end to the day. Showers will continue across much of Wales, though these will clear later this evening, leaving a mostly dry night, generally drier towards Cardiff and the south. Fewer showers are expected around the Midlands, with just a few isolated ones perhaps. These should quickly die away, meaning it will be a dry night for most, but chilly under clear skies. Towards the northeast, inland areas are likely to be largely dry with little cloud. Around the coast, though, it will be breezier and some showers are still likely here for a time. One or two showers around the coast of Scotland, otherwise it'll be a dry evening and it should stay that way overnight with a touch of frost in prone spots. It's a similar story for Northern Ireland, where any isolated showers will clear this evening. Clear skies mean it will be chilly tonight, but temperatures should stay above freezing. The daytime showers will mostly die out this evening, leaving a largely dry but chilly night under clear skies. That's how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News.
Now, Home Secretary Suella Braverman has told woke police chiefs to spend less time on diversity and symbolic gestures and focus on combating the rising levels of crime in England and Wales. Joining us now is former Metropolitan Detective Chief Inspector Mike Neville. Mike, what do you make of her yes, comments? Well, I think it's fantastic. You know, this is exactly what we need. I just hope these words turn into actions. You know, my personal experience, I wrote to the Chief Constable of Staffordshire offering help. And no, just no response from anybody. You know, you think, why, my question is, why don't the police want to solve more crime? And I think now the Home Secretary is going to get a grip of this. There's very simple things they can do. They can, my expertise is using images. We could increase the burglary detection rate. We could double it. Easy by using the, you know, the ring doorbells and home CCTV. But in the past, the police are just more interested in dancing the Macarena or taking the knee. Let's get back to fighting crime. I just really congratulate the Home Secretary, but I implore her to make sure that words become actions. Yes, I hope my parents don't mind me saying this on air, but their uh, car got nicked out of their drive uh, one night in the middle of the night. A couple of weeks later, they get a letter from the police saying, we've closed the case, can't do anything about it. Um, that's not on, well, is it really? Yeah. It's rubbish because, of course, their home has been invaded. People need better treatment. The, the police have turned into some sort of a crime report issuing society, which then you, you claim on your insurance. And, of course, if a car goes missing that or a van, that's somebody's uh, livelihood or their job. They can't get to work. Child's bike goes missing. They can't, they can't get to school. All these seemingly petty crimes really have a big impact. And I also hope the government, you know, as well as dealing with the, you know, getting the grip of the chief constables, ensure that they re-recruit officers, get back to the levels before which Theresa May trashed and cut, and they start recruiting the right people. No more uh, students. Let's have some ex-military, ex-army back into the police, because that's what the police need. Sir Robert Peel, when he set up the Metropolitan Police, said he wanted guards, sergeants as officers. Now, we've all seen how the guards paraded on the Queen's funeral how professional they are and they're the sort of men and women that we need in the police two questions do we need police and crime commissioners and do we need police officers to be graduates well firstly on the graduates thing i don't i, I got a degree i joined the army at 16 i got a degree in the police only because i got sick of hearing how clever people were who had degrees and were being promoted ahead of me so you don't need a degree you need a lot of uh, common sense and with the police and crime commissioners, we have this bizarre thing where in the States, you elect the police chief. In this uh, situation in the UK, you elect a police and crime commissioner who is above the chief constable. So who's the chief? The chief constable does all the operational stuff. And then the PCC is supposed to do the political. It's just nonsense. Either we either have no PCCs or we vote in the head of the police like they do in the States. The, the current situation is ridiculous it wastes a load of money and it's just uh, another way another place for political placement and women to go now i do sometimes feel we're a bit harsh on the police because they are expected to be everything to every one and the government has introduced successive governments have introduced all sorts of legislation that's very clumsy um coming from the equality act really but you know over hate speech hate crime legislation online policing of speech and so on and so forth it's quite hard for them to know what they're expected to do these days i agree you know and not only that we've got real crime you know, cyber crime is a new thing in the last 10 years fraud is out of control when you look at the police crime figures and they say oh uh, fraud is uh, you know crime has gone down, there's always an asterisk which says excluding fraud. So the police need to focus, but I just think that the Home Secretary has started off very well. She's refocusing them. You've got to fight against crime. They've got to look at how they deal with things like mental health. You know, the police are often tied up because social services or anybody else who's supposed to deal with them are off duty. So officers' time is taken away there. But I just really do reiterate the fact, I just think it's a good start. And for 12 years, we don't seem to have had a Conservative Home Secretary. No, no, we've got one. Fantastic. There you go. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. That was former Metropolitan Detective Chief Inspector Mike Neville. Thank you very much. Now, you're with GB News, of course, on TV and DAB radio. Next, we'll be discussing Ukrainians reporting armed soldiers are going door to door in occupied parts of the country to collect votes for self-styled referendums on joining Russia. But first, it's time to check on the news headlines.
It's 2.32. I'm Ray Addison in the GB Newsroom. The Labour leader is accusing the Chancellor of gambling the mortgages and finances of the British people with what he's calling casino economics. Sir Keir Starmer echoed claims from the Institute of Fiscal Studies which say the Chancellor's mini-budget puts government debt on an unsustainable rising path. That's something Kwasi Kwarteng denies. Chris Philp, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, told us the whole country will benefit. I think the real gamble would be maintaining levels of tax that are inappropriately high, which risk deterring investment, which risk disincentivising hard work and which risk driving individuals and companies out of the United Kingdom. By having competitive tax rates, we're encouraging people to work, encouraging them to invest and encouraging people and businesses to locate here in the UK. The Labour Party has pledged to create a national care service, claiming 13% of care homes need improvement. Ahead of the Labour Party conference, which starts tomorrow, they're saying private equity firms are failing in their duties to residents. Plans for the service include improvements to pay, workers' rights and training. Drivers could be paying an extra £5 for a tank of petrol due to a fall in the value of the pound. Motoring organisation, the AA, says petrol prices would be at least 9 pence per litre cheaper if the pound had maintained its mid-February value instead of dropping to a 37-year low. Ukraine's president is urging his fellow countrymen, who are forced to fight for the Russian army, to sabotage it from within. Volodymyr Zelensky says people in parts of Ukraine which are being controlled by Moscow should resist any efforts to mobilise them to fight. His address comes as the Kremlin launched so-called referendums yesterday aimed at annexing four occupied regions of Ukraine. And King Charles has been photographed with his red box for the very first time. The picture, which was taken last week, shows the king carrying out official government duties at Buckingham Palace. Red boxes hold papers from government ministers in the UK and the Commonwealth. On TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Emily will be back in just a moment. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flop at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther McVeigh. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back. This week, when Vladimir Putin addressed the Russian people for the first time since the start of the war in Ukraine, his mobilization speech sent clear signals. The threat of nuclear war is not to be underestimated, as EU officials are warning today that Putin is not bluffing on the subject. So what happens next? And should we believe Putin's message to his 
people. Joining me today is the defence editor of the Evening Standard newspaper, Robert Fox. So, should we be taking Putin's threats seriously? We should be taking uh, Putin seriously and we should be extremely worried about his state of mind because he is making very wild claims all over the place. Uh, this massive uh, mobilisation of forces. He said um, he wants to call up an extra 300,000 personnel for the fight in Ukraine. It's quite clear that he's using the apparatus of the police and military state in Russia to go through all kinds of communities, upsetting uh, communities through almost all of the 11 time zones of, of, of Russia. For what purpose is not clear. It looks as if he's aiming actually to mobilize 500,000. If you sent 500,000 into the parts of Ukraine where Russians are, they just simply wouldn't be able to support and sustain them. How are they going to train these people? Because they're losing their best equipment on the battlefield. There, aren't, there isn't enough equipment for a new army and there aren't enough trainers. Now, Con Kotlin, of the, the, he's the defence editor at The Telegraph, he said these are just empty threats and they show that Putin has nothing left. Is there some truth to that? Is he just sort of throwing things out to try and scare the West? Well, for far be from me to comment on one of my oldest friends and colleagues uh, in the business, uh, Con and I take roughly the same view. There is a lot of emptiness in, in this. But you're right in your question. It is not all entirely empty. And the daft bit, if I may say, that's the way that we have to look at it, and Con's right in, about this, is the threat of using weapons of mass destruction. And remember, I didn't say nuclear, because the real fear must be, yes, he may use tactical nuclear weapons. We can talk about that in a minute, because I think he'll be very reluctant to use them in the areas he's talking about annexing the four parts of Ukraine. I'm more worried about his use of chemical weapons of the indiscriminate kind that we have seen Russia sanction uh, among their Syrian allies, if not aid them in using in Syria. Now, am I right in thinking that the Russian state propaganda perhaps is starting to fall on deaf ears when it comes to ordinary Russian people? We've seen reports that Russians are attempting to flee the country so that they don't have to go to war to fight um, fight the Ukraine. And there are also some of the state TV seems to be changing a little in its narrative. We've had criticism on state TV for the first time, which is really quite something. Uh, where they can, young men, and it's young men primarily, are rushing to the border but of course, a lot of the borders are closed now, particularly into the Baltic states to the north, uh, uh, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia. But the big choke point is Georgia. Yes, they are fleeing. Yes, there has been criticism on state media, but the real information battle, the really big one that's happening now is in social media, where Russia has been devoting a huge effort, reported in the New York Times today, to shutting down things like Telegram, all kinds of, there are versions of WhatsApp. And in fact, the underground social media coverage of this thing has been really very, very remarkable. It's, they're using an incredible amount of labor of people to do this. Funny enough, the Chinese, when they do this, they do it much more effectively, and they do it with machinery and technology. But to go back to you, the way that you started this interview, you're absolutely right. There seems to be something absolutely desperate about the way Putin is behaving. Oh, by the way, he's just fired his deputy defense minister because he should have been in charge of logistics. That's moving around, supporting forces, getting this new uh, recruit, uh, recruitment drive really going so you can get 300,000 into camps, into being trained. And obviously that isn't going well. So he's fired that guy saying he's responsible. And I think there are real tensions now between the generals and Putin and also his old security buddies of the former KGB, now the FSB. And somehow if there's a crunch there, I think that they will get him out, but they will fight to get their particular candidate to take over. Things are a bit wobbly at the moment this weekend. I think this is the general sensation. And that's why, as usual, 
Vladimir Zelensky's propaganda, his information campaign, is absolutely brilliant. He brings up a new subject every night. He said, look, I'm on board with you, my, with my people. He never calls them my people, fellow Ukrainians. Look, this is what's happening. That's what's happening. And he's showing that he's on the case and as bright as a button. And he's more on the case than Vladimir Putin. Yes, and just finally, I want to get your thoughts on, well, something that's been concerning me recently in particular. I've seen a lot of some people, mostly on social media, admittedly, seeming to parrot um, Putin lines uh, from, from Russian propaganda lines that you know, we shouldn't be giving so much money over to Ukraine because they're just money laundering it and that there's some kind of conspiracy that this war is intended to go on and on and cripple us financially. All sorts of uh, talking points like that seem to be being spread far and wide. Could you please just uh, put, your, put your point across uh, to perhaps uh, debunk those? Of course, it's all a huge CIA plot. <laughs> Zelensky is a CIA plot. The, uh, uh, the Maidan uh, uprising in 2014, which really started this, all entirely, of course, was uh, a CIA plot. I'm sorry to indulge in this, but because, of course, my Twitter feed is completely polluted with this stuff. Some of it is genuine cranks, uh, the work of genuine cranks. Uh, you always get them. But quite Certainly, a lot of this is, is, is Russian, Moscow-inspired trolling. It's a desperate campaign. Is it having an effect? As of now, not much, because the two key alliances, NATO and, I must say, the EU, have stuck with it. Russia is trying to chisel away at bits of Asia and bits of Africa, with whom they, the countries where they've had links, to get support there. But the one big one which isn't buying this is China. And China, if this is going to be settled, it's not going to be settled on Russia's terms. If they come in, and they may come in after October the 5th, when Xi gets reconfirmed, as he hopes, for another 10 years running things in China, it will be settled entirely on China's terms. Watch out. Well, there you go. Thank you very much, Robert, for joining us uh, this afternoon on Real Britain. That was defence editor of the Evening Standard, Robert Fox. Now, moving on. Over the past week, experts in hate and religious crime say that the violence seen in Leicester between Hindus and Muslims could present a new challenge to social cohesion across Britain. This, of course, comes as hundreds of young men clashed with the police as the atmosphere was aggravated by online videos showing a man pulling down a flag outside a Hindu temple. Leicestershire police said they are working to keep you safe and to arrest and bring to justice those that are causing harm in our communities. Joining me now to discuss this is Im Imran Hamid, founder of Bearded Bros. Hi, Mohammed. Hi, Hi Imran. Sorry, I completely read your name wrong. Imran, thank you very much for joining me on Real Britain. Now, thank you were in me. the West Midlands in Smethwick, I believe, where tensions Correct. seem to be simmering as well. What's been going on there? Uh, this is all on the back of what's going on in Leicester uh, for the sort of past few weeks. Uh, what we have is all, we have a movement from India, uh, namely the RSS, which is uh, a far-right movement who have been protesting on the streets and is getting a bit ugly over there, and the, the police are having to pick up the sort of uh, mess. Um, the same sort of things going on over here where we've had a lot of fake news uh, across social media, people saying, oh, there's going to be a protest outside the Hindu temples. Uh, so, yeah, that's where we're, we're at. And then we had, uh, a couple of days ago, about 150, 200 people protesting outside the, outside the Hindu temple. Uh, so that's where we are at now. Community leaders uh, of the Hindu community and the Muslim community have stood up and they've said, uh, you know, we want uh, unity, we want people to get along together, we don't stand for this, etc., etc. But it doesn't seem to be seeping into the communities themselves. What can we do to try and unify uh, people who clearly can't get along? Uh, the, the, the problem is, right, this is not a Hindu Muslim uh, affair. This is not this. This is. Um, the how if if we had for example isis walking the streets me as a muslim i would stand up and condemn that 
right, I'm sure everybody else would as well. This is a far right movement against Muslims. These are people who are chanting religious slurs outside a mosque, prov provoking Muslim youngsters to act. Uh, this is not a fight against Hindus and Muslims. We as uh, community leaders, faith leaders, we're all standing there with the, with the Hindu temples, with the Sikh Gurdwaras, the Muslim mosques and saying, listen, we're all one. We've lived happily for decades without any problems. Okay, we should not let any far right movement, whatever they call themselves. But Imran, 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 yes. of course, that's your opinion. But then on the other side, there are many Hindus who believe that there are Islamists on the street who have been making accusations against them and threatening them and so on and so forth. So it seems to me that there are conflicts that are ongoing. And a lot of people watching today will be worried that we're going to see more of this in other towns and cities across the United Kingdom and that you know, multiculturalism, while it brings lots of benefits, also means that we import conflicts from other countries. So how can we, without uh, blaming one group over another, how can we sort this out? Like I said to you, uh, regardless of what they call themselves, Islamist terrorists, RSS, neo-Nazis, whatever they call themselves, you and I need to stand in condemnation. Doesn't matter who we are, if I'm Muslim and the other person is a Hindu or a Christian or atheist, we all need to call this out for what it is. If it's Islamist terrorists, if it's Hindu terrorists, if we all stand united, nobody can get in between us. That's my whole point. I'm not blaming a certain person, but the, the, the troubles in Leicester have been called by Hindu extremists. And now, we need what to we need. A state. State. What we need, really, because Leicester, for example, has been held up by some in the media and some people as this, you know, a place where people of all different backgrounds have been able to live side by side, together, integrate, live a nice life, live, live a cohesive life in Britain. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore, at least with these specific individuals. People have been locking themselves in their homes because they're scared of the violence and what could erupt. Is this just down to dialogue? Do the police need to get tougher on these things? The police definitely need to step up its game, but I disagree with you. I, in the in the Smetic incidents a few days ago, me and 50 other Muslim community members were inside of the Hindu temple protecting the temple, right? The protesting was very much peaceful. There was about 30 seconds of madness, yes, okay? But most of it, I, I think everybody, normal Hindu and normal Muslim people, do not want this. The police needs to needs to definitely step up their game and take robust actions on anyone, regardless of which side they're on. Right? Mm. If they are getting physical or threatening people, this needs to stop, and the police needs to t toughen up on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Imran Hamid, founder of the Bearded Bros. Thank, Thank you. you very much for joining us on this important topic today. Now we've got a description here, I believe. Oh no, we don't. We're going to move on now. So. A new survey by the British Social Attitudes Survey has found that public support for transgender people being allowed to change their sex on their birth certificate has fallen sharply to 32%. That's a drop of 21 points in the last two years. Professor Sir John Curtis, Senior Research Fellow at the National Centre for Social Research, which published the report, joins me now. Sir John, can you tell me a bit about this survey? What does it show? Well, the... A couple of questions we asked about transgender were part of a wider uh, a project in which we were interested at trying to ascertain people's views and how they might have changed and who had what views on the broader issue of what we've come to know as culture wars, of which the debate about transgender is regarded by some as part. So uh, you have to understand it's part of a much wider project. And there were only a couple of questions about transgender, and it wasn't uh, the survey wasn't particularly doing an in-depth study of attitudes towards transgender people. That said, what did we discover? Well, we discovered a couple of things that are actually in line with other uh, survey research and polling out there. One, as you've already said, is that when you ask people whether or not people should be able to change their legal gender, which is what we were trying to get at when we said to people should they be able to change the gender that's recorded on their birth certificate? It looks as though 
there has been a decline, although there was a very slight change in the wording of the question, to around public opinion being more or less evenly divided, 32% in favour, 39% against. That's in line with other uh, polling work. The other question we asked was to ask people whether or not equal opportunities for people uh, who are transgender had gone too far or not gone far enough on that public opinion split pretty much exactly down the middle with a third saying they'd gone too far and a third saying they'd not gone far enough. And I think there is no doubt. I mean, there, you know, this is a subject which, A, has really only entered, has become a subject of wide social debate during the course of the last few years, number one. Two, we know actually a lot of people are still not engaged in that debate. But yeah. the three, you know, that clearly it is a subject on which opinion is divided. And that it may be, though I stress maybe, that as some of this debate has started and become more widely known, the issue at least of changing people's legal gender is one where as yet those who are advocating it should be made easier for trans people to do this have not necessarily won the argument. Though I should say other research also indicates that if you ask whether people should be allowed to change their social gender, in other words, should somebody who feels uh, that they're a man having been born a woman should be able to dress in women's clothes, should be re uh, should be uh, acknowledged as he, etc. That does seem to be something that does gain fairly widespread it's acceptance. Quite, it's quite interesting because the Times wrote up your report um, and focused on this this area um, at the start of its article, and they framed it as attitudes are not getting more liberal. And in my mind, it's simply it's simply that these this issue has come to the fore. People understand it more. They understand the trade-offs, the way transgender rights um, uh, relate to women's rights, and so on and so forth. So people are just a bit more clued up. It's not that they're suddenly becoming little authoritarians. Well, that, you know that may well be true. I mean, what is true, however, is that. Uh, even on this issue, as indeed is true of most of the issues in the so culture wars debate, is something where those people whom you can classify on the basis of other questions as social liberals are more likely to be, say, uh, trans people should be able to change their legal gender than are those who are of uh, a more socially conservative disposition. But again, you know, one of the reasons why this is interesting is that you know, on virtually all of the other issues that we asked about, you know, things like, you know, should, do we think that Britain is better than other countries? Should we pr have pride in our past? Um, you know, should we be doing more to acknowledge the position of uh, black and Asian people? On all of those issues, you know, we certainly have become more liberal. Uh, the interesting thing about the transgender debate is it does stand out as being one where so far, at least, it's not moved in the same direction. That said, of course, somebody who, like myself, who's been engaged in this kind of research for a very long time, where we stand on attitudes towards transgender reminds me very much of where we stood on attitudes towards same-sex relationships little more than 20 years ago. That again, uh, at that stage, we were pretty evenly divided on the subject with, yes, older people uh, less uh, willing to say that same-sex relations were okay than were younger people, women more likely to say that it was okay than, than men. And that, by the way, is also true and transgender, although a lot of the talk is well, about so John, spaces. I'm not sure you can compare those two like that. People to change their gender. I'm not I'm not sure you can make the. I'm not sure you can make the comparison between same-sex relationships and attitudes towards um, things like self-ID and and legal legal sex changes. Um, but anyway, that was very very interesting for you to go over um, what you found in your research paper. And of course, as John said, there was so much more else in there other than uh, the transgender issue. So please do take a look at it. That was Professor Sir John Curtis, senior research fellow at the National Centre for Social Research, which published a report we were just talking about. Now in the studio, I have Debbie Hayton. Thank you very much for joining me here in the studio. Um, what do you make of that? What do you make of this report? Do you think people are getting less liberal? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, my, my everyday life, people are tolerant, people are accepting. People take me for who I am. They're more interested in can I do a good job in society, can I be a valuable member of society. The fact I'm trans is not an issue. So what do you think's changed people's um, view on the whole changing your sex legally and that sort of thing. I imagine self-identification has become more problematic for people. 
Well, I think people have become more aware of the mm. issues. If you go back two, three years, people didn't really know what was happening. And their view was that there was a tiny number of transsexual people who had a diagnosable psychiatric condition, and this was making their life easier. So it didn't really affect them. I think over the last two years, the debate has uh, come to the public knowledge, and it's come to the fore. And people are aware that this is a much wider group of people who are uh, who who are involved here? It's not just a tiny number of transsexuals who will have gender reassignment surgery, go through hormone therapy. This is a larger group of people who identify into a category rather than as a result of something they've done to their bodies. Yeah, and a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago, I interviewed a young lady who had experienced gender dysphoria. Um, she then essentially uh, grew out of it, to put it you know, bluntly. Um, she was then diagnosed with autism and she had other mental health issues that she needed to overcome. And during her teenage years, uh, she wanted to change gender and she almost got, um, went through the process, but um, for one reason or another, it never went ahead. Do you think that that's one of the issues that maybe people are feeling a little more skeptical in this debate because they're worried about children being pressurised or feeling pressurised uh, to go down that route? Well, yes, we're presented this narrative that we all have a gender identity and that is our destiny almost, to, uh, to find our gender identity and then live it. Whereas there's no basis for this in science. There's no evidence of its gender identity. It's been a lazy description which has been applied to a number of different conditions. And you're right that children have been, uh, have been drawn into this. Children have been told that, uh, that if they have a gender identity, they need to act on that. And that's not helpful for children and it's not, it's not helpful for anybody else. And that is a concern for a lot of people. Yes, and we've also seen some of, just finally, we've seen some, um, well, pretty crazy protests and rallies um, from perhaps what you could call the extremes of the transgender lobby. Uh, we saw one activist shouting profanities at um, you know, a man and, and, and his baby, um, which people, which was shared across social media as these things are. Um, do you think the extremes there, well, they're letting down the movement, aren't they? They're making it seem like it's a very fringe group of people now. Uh, these people that you're talking about have nothing to do with the transsexuals who have transitioned and want to get on with our mm. lives. Uh, it seems to me there are a group of people who have, found, who have attached themselves to this cause because it allows them to it allows them to express this part of their nature and feel to be virtuous about it. So that they can scream at women, they can accuse women of being all sorts of things, and that they, and in themselves, they see, they see themselves as being good people as a result of that. And that's what is dangerous. Yes, we've got a lot of that going on in our society. Thank you so much for coming in today. Now, a few moments ago, we were speaking about the tensions between Hindus and Muslims in the Midlands. The leaders of the Hindu and Muslim communities in Leicester have issued this joint statement, which I will read out. Our two faiths have lived harmoniously in this wonderful city for over half a century. We arrived in the city together, we faced the same challenges together, we fought off racist haters together and collectively made this city a beacon of diversity and community cohesion. What we have seen is not what we are about. We ask all to respect the sanctity of religious places, both mosques and temples alike. There's some wishful thinking. Uh, it's not looking like things are so harmonious at the moment, but anyway, you're watching Real Britain with me, Emily Carr. However, it's time for a short break. I'll see you in the next hour. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flop at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Hey!
my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints were over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown up way. Come and join me on Farrow. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back. This is Real Britain on your TV, radio and online. Now, this hour, we'll be discussing fracking. The ban was lifted in England this week, but when will we actually start to frack? Also, we'll look ahead to the Labour conference that starts tomorrow. But first, let's go to the news with Ray Addison. Thanks, Emily. Three minutes past three. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. The leader of the Labour Party is accusing the Chancellor of gambling the mortgages and finances of the British people with what he's calling casino economics. Sir Keir Starmer echoed claims from the Institute of Fiscal Studies which say the government's mini-budget puts government debt on an unsustainable rising path. That's something Kwasi Kwarteng denies. Chris Philp, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, told GB News the whole country will benefit. I think the real gamble would be maintaining levels of tax that are inappropriately high, which risk deterring investment, which risk disincentivising hard work and which risk driving individuals and companies out of the United Kingdom. By having competitive tax rates, we're encouraging people to work, encouraging them to invest and encouraging people and businesses to locate here in the UK. Former Tory Health Secretary Stephen Dorrell, who defected to the Liberal Democrats, told GB News the mini-budget takes the Tory party back to their beliefs of the early 1970s. One of the things that you have to deliver as a government is sound money. And my concern, my principal concern this week, is that it, the actions of the government are undermining the commitment to sound money, which was the essential bedrock of both the Thatcher and major administrations. Well, Labour's Steve Reid is Shadow Secretary of State for Justice. He says the budget does very little for working people. It looks to me like they've gone to the casino and they've, they've gambled the British economy and British people's um, household finances um, on a set of uncosted tax cuts that benefit the super wealthy but do very little to help anybody else. The Labour Party says it wants to create a national care service, claiming 13% of care homes need improvement. Ahead of the Labour Party conference tomorrow, the party says private equity firms are failing in their duties to residents. Plans for the service include improving pay, workers' rights and training. Drivers could be paying an extra £5 for a tank of petrol due to a fall in the value of the pound. Motoring organisation the AA says petrol prices would be at least 9 pence per litre cheaper if the pound had maintained its mid-February value instead of dropping to a 37-year low. Drivers are being encouraged to shop around to find more competitive prices. The Home Secretary is telling police forces in England and Wales to prioritise what she's calling common-sense policing over diversity and inclusion initiatives. In an open letter to police chiefs, Suella Braverman laid out key priorities in her crime-cutting agenda, saying culture and standards have to change. Ms Braverman says she's dismayed at the lack of confidence in the force and is determined to restore the public's trust. GB News has seen evidence of thousands of people camped around Dunkirk and Calais waiting to cross the English Channel in small boats. It comes as another 656 made the journey in 15 inflatables yesterday, bringing the total number who've crossed so far this year to well over 32,000. GB News's Kent producer says they're gathering in makeshift camps, mainly Africans, Iranians and Iraqis. GB News has also been told that border force facilities at Doba Harbour are critically overloaded. 
Ukraine's president is urging his fellow countrymen who are forced to fight for the Russian army to sabotage it from within. Volodymyr Zelensky says people in parts of Ukraine which are being controlled by Moscow should resist any efforts to mobilize them to fight. However, if they do get conscripted, they should do everything they can to help their homeland. The address comes as the Kremlin launched so-called referendums yesterday aimed at annexing four occupied regions of Ukraine. If you still find yourself in the Russian army, sabotage any enemy activity. Send us any relevant information about occupiers, their bases, HQs, ammo caches, and with the first opportunity, move to our side. Do everything to save your life and free Ukraine. King Charles has been photographed with his red box for the very first time. The picture, taken last week, shows the king carrying out official government duties at Buckingham Palace. And Roger Federer has bid farewell to professional tennis, bowing out with a doubles defeat at the O2 Arena in London. The 20-time Grand Slam champion teamed up with old rival Rafael Nadal for the Labour Cup match, but lost to an American pair. The Swiss player announced his plans to retire from the sport last week. You're watching GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's get back to Real Britain with Emily Carver. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. So here's what's coming up on the show. The ban of fracking was up, was lifted in England this week. Business and Energy Secretary Jacob Rees-Mogg says it's important we develop our own energy. Even with the reversal of the ban, permit arrangements still remain very strict. So when will we actually start fracking? And the annual Labour Party conference starts tomorrow. Woohoo! The party conference will open with a rendition of the national anthem. Is this a sign that Sir Keir Starmer is feeling confident, or at least patriotic? Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng has announced a mini-budget he believes will boost economic growth in the cost-of-living crisis, but some Labour MPs have described the plans as a class war. I think that was the... Uh, Former Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell who said that. Now Conservative MP Bob Blackman will join me on the show this hour to discuss that. That's what we're going to be talking about for the next hour. And in Solve the Palaver with me, Emily Carver, I'd love to know your thoughts on the growth plan that was announced yesterday. Was it just a budget for the rich or is go for growth the best mentality? Tweet me at GB News or you can email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can watch us online too on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. You'll find lots of brilliant content on the GB News page. Thank you very much. Now, the government announced an end to the ban on fracking in, in England this week. The ban came into force in 2019 due to concerns about earth tremors. But now the plan is for us to become more self-sufficient, producing our own energy here in the UK. Hence the ban on fracking being lifted. But when will frac fracking actually start in England? I've said that word too many times today. So to debate whether this is a welcome announcement, I'm joined by the Director of Policy, Government and Public Affairs at UK onshore oil and gas in the studio with me, Charles McAllister. Thank you, Charles, climate spokesman for the Conservative Environment Network, Jack Richardson. Thank you, Jack. And Lois Perry, the director of Car26, a group who provide climate analysis. So, Charles, you're in the studio with me, so yeah. I'll go to you first. It's all well and good saying we're going to lift the moratorium on fracking, but there are lots of NIMBYs and there are also lots of environmental regulations still to deal with. What's the chances of this going ahead? I think the chances are very good. I mean, I was very pleased, obviously, that the government lifted the moratorium, but we've been totally clear that isn't enough. We need comprehensive policy reform, especially on planning and permitting. If the government deliver that, we will deliver jobs, energy security, community benefits, a huge range of things. The case for fracking in the UK is blindingly obvious. So, Jack, is, could this be said to be part of the levelling up strategy? This could boost some regions of the UK where shale gas can get going. 
Um, so basically, my opinion is uh, that um, that you saw yesterday in the budget that we had fracking uh, ban lifted, but we also had onshore wind ban lifted. So I think at this point, it's it's basically made the best energy source win. Um, I do think um, personally, from an energy perspective, rather than an environmental perspective, that Charles has his work cut out a lot more than than renewables because renewables are just much more popular. They do cut bills and they can go up a lot faster. Uh, there's not that sort of big opposition to them. Um, so, but yeah, to be honest, I'm I'm just quite happy beaming. <laughs> No, so I can see you shaking your head there on that. What do you want to say? He might, the thing that always... Um, hello, good afternoon, Emily, by the way. Good afternoon. Um, he, might, he knows that renewables are heavily subsidised. They are not cheaper and they're certainly not popular. In actual fact, at national level with polling, they say that it is popular renewables, but on a local level, um, planning uh, applications are very regularly turned down for wind farms and solar farms because they're hideous, they're expensive, and they don't work. Um, so and he must know that. So, you know, that's totally disingenuous. I'm sorry. Jack, I'll let you, Jack, I'll let you come back on what Lois just said. You're the, a spokesperson from the Conservative Environment Network. Hit back on that. Um, I'm, like I know, NIMBYism is a problem in this country. Um, fracking also has lots of lots of people um, coming against it on the planning applications. I don't think that's like that's not really an argument to be honest. Okay. What about polling, the subsidies? But what you're saying is polling, cheap. Polling, you're saying it's not, yeah, talk about that, the subsidies now, because it's not okay, Lois. Yes, yes, Jack. On that point, on the subsidies, are renewables very heavily subsidised? So there's the old renewables obligation that was created by Labour. Um, Conservatives went to a contract for difference, which is now kicking in. They're not adding anything to our bills whatsoever now. They actually pay back into the system because the price of gas is so high and that's what's setting the price of power. You can check that out. It, it, it's true. Sorry. Look, <laughs> I, 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 back Charles, yes, I'll let you come in on, on that. I think a really important point here is there is no question there is a NIMBY issue in the UK and that applies across the board. Wind, solar, house building, shale gas. I think a really big benefit of shale gas compared to renewables is the energy density. So a shale gas pad is about two hectares in size, but the size of a football pitch. To produce the same amount of energy from a wind farm, you need a land area 725 times the size. So in terms of delivering kilowatt hours per acre per year, fracking is the best technology in the UK. Again, we do need the reform to change that. But I think the narrative coming out of the government is really, really positive. Because see if we continue down the business as usual approach, the economic, environmental and geopolitical consequences are very severe. Isn't this the problem, Lewis? I don't care where we get our energy from as long as it's cheap. And, you know, I can switch on my heating without having a bill the size of the length of my arm. So, well, with a number the length of my arm anyway, the number of digits. <laughs> so is the problem not that the government should simply stop trying to pick winners, liberalise the planning so that people can get whatever it is, whether it's solar or shale gas exploration or whatever, just going? Yeah. Yeah, let, let, let things uh, fly or die on, let them stand on their own two feet. You know, they, if, if solar and wind are so fantastic, take all the subsidies off. Don't give, uh, don't give the people that actually, you know, do this stuff huge amounts of money, a fixed amount of money over a long period of time. And let's compare it. You know, it's just absolute nonsense. Renewables are a joke, an absolute joke. Strong we stuff, Lewis. Fracking, and I'm so happy and I'm, Charles is happy. It's great. We need to get fracking as soon as possible. We need Strong stuff, but I must put... Like the Olympic Act. That's I must put the genuine concern that some people do have. Now, fracking was banned in 2019. That was after it caused some earth tremors near Blackpool, I believe. Yeah, that is was there the not, equivalent of me sitting on this chair. Is there not an issue the that it can be dangerous and disruptive to local citizens? Can I, can I answer that? Local residents. I'll go Lois and then we'll go to you, Charlie. Okay. Sorry, you want me to answer that? Charles is probably the best person to Charles, answer that. But Charles, we'll get you on that one. But the equivalent um, of, you know, these alleged tremors is, is, is the same as a bus going past your window or me sitting yeah. on this chair. Honestly. Go on, Charlie. Right, so the, the regulations that were put in place for us, if you applied those regulations to the geothermal construction or quarrying industry, none of them would have been able to operate in the UK, all right? It was 0.5 on the Richter scale we had to stop at. That's the same as me sitting down on this chair, so I wouldn't say that's a significant 
second event. The, <laughs> the moratorium was based on a report on the Preston New Road 1Z well. Largest event of that well was 1.5 on the Richter scale. It's the surface equivalent of me dropping a honeydew melon in this studio. Again, I don't think that's a serious event. And the largest <laughs> event from the Preston New Road site on the PNR2 well was a 2.9 on the Richter scale. The surface vibration from that is half of the maximum permitted at construction sites. I think a really important point here is we're not asking for special treatment, even on planning, on seismicity or on environmental permitting. We're asking for parity in regulations. We just want to be treated fairly. Jack, of course we are signed up to net zero. Now the fracking ban may have been lifted, but there are various regulations such as, I believe it's called the climate compatibility check or something like that, that people who want to uh, frack in certain areas will have to uh, essentially not sign up to, but uh, I can't remember, I can't think of the word, but they have to essentially, there are regulations that may well put fracking, will stop fracking exploration or, or, or oil and gas exploration around the country. Do you think that fracking simply isn't compatible with, with net zero? Um, so, I, like Charles might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the climate compatibility test actually applies to onshore. I think it applies to offshore, but it's not going to start this like licensing round, which is starting next month, which is going to see about 100 oil and okay. gas licenses. It, it, uh, um, actually, it, in, terms zero, in terms of net zero, I, I, I'm completely fine with the logic that having our own shale gas is less emissions than importing US shale gas. It's just from an energy policy perspective, I'm just quite skeptical that like fracking is going to yield that much gas, but I'm not alone in that. I'm like most of the energy industries are. Oh, 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 can I jump in as well? Charlie, are we over egging this? No, the potential, the potential for fracking is absolutely huge. If we can get 10% of the 500 years worth of gas out of the ground, that's enough for 50 years of supply. The value of it is trillions and trillions of pounds, okay? It's really interesting to hear that the Conservative Environment... Network, hold on a second, hold on. It's really interesting to hear the Conservative Environment Network point now is a bit more nuanced, because you guys put out a video in February that, frankly, was full of mistruths. You said there was 6,000 wells needed to cut our gas demand in half. That's not true. You said it would industrialise the countryside. I've already addressed that point. So it is good to see that your position on fracking is slightly moving towards where more will be. Or on the climate change point, the carbon intensity of shale gas has been forecast to be a quarter of that of liquefied natural gas. So if we don't develop shale and we over rely on LNG, our gas supply carbon footprint goes through the roof. Jack, I'll let you come back on that and then I'll give Lewis the final, I'll give Lewis the final word. Yes, yeah, sure. Jack. Uh, I, I don't have any problem with the, with, the, with the logic around carbon emissions. It's like I said, it's just I'm like you're going to have to persuade a lot of communities to have fracking in order to like shift the amount of gas that we need because we used to have Russia in our gas market they've cut down all our like all their supply it's going to take a lot to to sort of shift that and I'm just quite skeptical that you're going to be able to do that they tried very hard in Poland there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of investment there's a lot of community support there's a lot of government support they just didn't manage to and that, I don't know like maybe very quickly then Lewis gets the final word Charlie it, as well. it didn't work it didn't work in Poland it didn't work in Poland for geological reasons, Jack. It was like trying to frack Play-Doh. OK, the two things you need for the, for the geology to work, it needs Very to be quickly, low Charles. in clay and high in total organic carbon content. We've got both of those. We've got both of those. Lois, I'll give the final word to you. Uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with carbon. Uh, CO2 does not cause any climate change. The whole thing's a joke. And um, But even, even if you're believing it all, it's still best to frack. So there well, there you go. Well, That's I'm what Lois think, thinks argument. it's all a crock. <laughs> Thank you very much, all of you, for joining me today. That was heated in places, but very interesting and hopefully informative to our viewers this afternoon. Thank you to Lois Perry, Charlie McAllister and Jack Richardson. I very much appreciate all of your time. You. Now, there's plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, we'll be previewing the annual Labour Party conference, which starts tomorrow. Uh, but first, let's have a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and there will be a scattering of showers across England and Wales, but drier further north. Here are the details. Starting in the southwest and across northern parts of Devon and Cornwall, there'll still be a few showers around this evening, but further south, it's looking mostly dry. There may still be a few showers continuing throughout the afternoon in the southeast as well, but for many, it'll be a fine end to the day. 
Showers will continue across much of Wales, though these will clear later this evening, leaving a mostly dry night, generally drier towards Cardiff and the south. Fewer showers are expected around the Midlands, with just a few isolated ones perhaps. These should quickly die away, meaning it will be a dry night for most, but chilly under clear skies. Towards the northeast, inland areas are likely to be largely dry with little cloud. Around the coast, though, it will be breezier and some showers are still likely here for a time. One or two showers around the coast of Scotland, otherwise it'll be a dry evening and it should stay that way overnight with a touch of frost in prone spots. It's a similar story for Northern Ireland, where any isolated showers will clear this evening. Clear skies mean it will be chilly tonight, but temperatures should stay above freezing. The daytime showers will mostly die out this evening, leaving a largely dry but chilly night under clear skies. That's how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, mate. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Now, in case you missed it, the annual Labour Party conference gets underway in Liverpool tomorrow. Members have been urged to sing God Save the King, of course. The Union Jack will be brought back and Sir Keir Starmer has snubbed attending the annual Durham Miners Gala. So is this the much vaunted return of so-called moderate Blairism within the Labour Party, or something at least a little bit patriotic. With me now to discuss this further is former Labour MP Stephen Pound. Stephen, what's the Labour Party conference going to be like this year? Different. 
in a word. Um, look, a lot of people don't understand what happens at the Labour Party conference. People think it's a sort of a job fair for sociopaths, basically, but it, it's not. It's actually a, a policy making process. But what's more important is that, I mean, I've been going to Labour Party conferences um, since you were a glint in your father's eye. Um, and, you know, I'm not there this weekend, so I've got time off for good behaviour. But look, um, one of the things we do, the conference actually starts officially tomorrow, but people will be up there this evening, there'll be dinners this evening. And tomorrow morning, um, as in every Labour Party conference, there'll be a church service. Um, the Christian Socialist Movement will have a church service. Catholics for Labour will have a church service in in Liverpool Cathedral. Um, there'll also be a football match against the uh, the reptiles, sorry, the, the uh, ladies and gentlemen of the press. Uh, there's a lot goes on. But on the Monday, we will actually be doing what everybody else is doing and reaffirming our commitment to the new king. Because never forget, Emily, the Labour Party, we are His Majesty's loyal opposition. You know, we're not playing pavement politics or puerile schoolboy stuff and like, you know, Liz Trusted when she was in the Liberal Democrats, you know, calling for the abolition of the monarchy. We've got Republicans in the Labour Party. We've got Republicans in the Conservative Party. You know, but we're going to talk about it as grown ups. But for the moment, this is oh. the first conference of the passing of Her Majesty, and we are going to express our loyalty as mm. his as his opposite loyal opposition to the king. Stephen, the problem is is that a lot of the Labour activists, the membership, uh, think that this is just posturing and fake fakeness from Keir Starmer and that this patriotism is just to try and, I don't know, f fuel sentiment uh, among the red wall or whatever, but not actually l what Labour should be standing up for. A lot of them are very much Republican and very loud about it. But Keir, Keir Starmer did some service to the state. Don't forget, Keir Starmer is one of the most patriotic people I've ever met. I worked with him in, in Northern Ireland. He was the director of public prosecutions in Northern Ireland, one of the most dangerous jobs you could possibly imagine. I mean, he didn't have one, two. He had, he had three plus close protection morning, noon and night. And he did that in the name of the crown. He was the crown prosecutor. He's about as patriotic as you can get. Look, I mean, I have my views. Other people have their views. But to imply that the Labour Party is a hotbed of frothing republicanism, we're going to erect a guillotine um, in Horse Guards Parade tomorrow morning and have, go off with their heads. I mean, you know, there may be, actually, there could well be one or two people who think that way. But there'll be one or two people in all the parties. But look, the Labour Party is a grown-up, sensible party. We're not playing gesture politics. We're not actually trying to reach out to a whole group of people who are passionately patriotic. It's a, The great thing about this country countries. It should be an unstated, quiet, sober, responsible patriotism. Not making a big song and dance about it. We're not going to yes, sing the I national guess, anthem. I, I guess like with most things, it's just the loudest voices that get heard and get put across in the media, of course, and that happens to be the, the far left activists in, in the party, in the membership. Anyway, moving on um, to another topic, Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss have certainly given the Labour Party something to uh, rally against. They've given us something to rally for. They've given us to actually say they, they've, they've basically sunk the economy below the waterline. We are in a state of absolute utter catastrophe. It's one thing, you know, writing blank checks that are never going to be cashed. But these are writing checks that are going to be cashed by my grandchildren, your, well, certainly my, your grandchildren, maybe not mine. Look, the Labour Party is now united in the fact that for once, and, you know, all for years, not you, I mean, you're an exception to this, but a lot of commentators have said, you know, there was no clear blue water, no clear red water between us. There really is now. You've actually got a policy where you make the rich richer beyond the grounds of obscenity, beyond the very dreams of avarice. You make Hang on, so under rich. Blair there was a 40% higher rate tax, uh, income tax yep. rate. The, 40, the 45 was only a drop from Gordon Brown's 50. It's not like the Labour Party has always taxed yeah. people to the hilt. <laughs> Well, no, in, 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 in Callaghan's time, it was 96%, if you may remember. <laughs> no, no, you well, that's madness. That. Surely you agree that's madness. <laughs> Well, it, it did mean that a lot of people said that they're going to leave the country and never come back, although, to be fair, none of them ever did. But look, the, 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 re the reality is that you, know, you can reduce the lower later or, so it, or increase the threshold at which you start to pay tax, and that will be the tide that lifts all the boats. To give the people on £150,000 a year this additional benefit on the grounds that they may possibly wake up my morning and say, good Lord alive, I've got so much dosh, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to actually create a business, I'm going to employ people, ben. I'm going to give everybody a pay rise. I'm sorry, it's, it's Mickey Mouse. Fanciful Stephen, I understand. Ben. I understand the optics of it, but it's not a handout or a benefit. It's just taking less of their own money that they've earned. This phrasing from the left of tax cuts as handouts, benefits, and giveaways is just something that makes me want to put my head in my hands because it's not. It's just the state taking less of your money as it should be. No. 
Look, we all take benefits from the state, every one of us. We travel on public roads, you know, we use the police force, we rely on the military to protect us. We all take benefits from the state. You know, nobody should ever deny that it's a zero-sum game, that we only get back what we put in. And it's perfectly reasonable to say that those with the broadest shoulders should bear the strongest load. I just really don't see what's wrong with it. We have a progressive taxation system in this country. Everybody accepts that. But what we don't understand, what we don't accept in the Labour Party, is why the people at the bottom end of the scale should suffer proportionately far worse than those at the top. That simply doesn't make sense. Well, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that they increase the income tax threshold so that brings uh, uh, more people out of the higher rate and out of the basic income rate. That was what I would like to see, but I don't have a problem with uh, that 45p being slashed, actually. Um, but I can see the optics are a bit dodge. Anyway, thank you very much, Stephen, for joining me. That, was, of course, was Stephen Pound, former Labour MP, who's not going to Labour conference this year. He's off for good behaviour, I think. Anyway, thank you very much for his time. You're with GB News on TV, radio and online next we'll be talking to a farmer in the west midlands who was left furious by just stop oil protests protesters leaving rubbish on his land so don't go anywhere that'll be a good one now it's time to check on the news headlines with ray addison thanks emily 32 minutes past three here's the latest the Labour leader is accusing the Chancellor of gambling the mortgages and finances of the British people with what he's calling casino economics. Sir Keir Starmer echoed claims from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, which say the Chancellor's mini-budget puts government debt on an unsustainable rising path. That's something Kwasi Kwarteng denies. Chris Philp, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, told us the whole country will benefit. I think the real gamble would be maintaining levels of tax that are inappropriately high, which risk deterring investment, which risk disincentivising hard work and which risk driving individuals and companies out of the United Kingdom. By having competitive tax rates, we're encouraging people to work, encouraging them to invest and encouraging people and businesses to locate here in the UK. The Labour Party conference is about to begin in Liverpool as they pledged to create a national care service, claiming 13% of care homes need improvement. They say private equity firms are failing in their duties to residents. Plans for the service include improvements to pay, workers' rights and training. Ukraine's president is urging his fellow countrymen who are forced to fight for the Russian army to sabotage it from within. Volodymyr Zelensky says people in parts of Ukraine which are being controlled by Moscow should resist any efforts to mobilise them to fight. His address comes as the Kremlin launched so-called referendums yesterday aimed at annexing four occupied regions of Ukraine. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Emily will be back in just a mo. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news, 
and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Now, this is a story you may have missed. A farmer took to Twitter this week to vent his anger at campaign group Just Stop Oil for leaving piles of plastic bottles, plastic chairs and plastic bags full of rubbish on his land after trying to tunnel under a road by the Kingsbury Oil Terminal in Warwickshire. It has led to the group being accused of hypocrisy at its finest. Let's see what Charles Gobi had to say. So here we are in the heart of the beautiful Warwickshire countryside. And yet, if I look through this hedge just here, there's rubbish dumped everywhere. You can see what we've got, sleeping bags, plastic bags full of rubbish, liners, more plastic, plastic bottles, plastic chairs, more plastic chairs. How is this acceptable? People dumping over our British countryside, polluting it, destroying the countryside and putting our wildlife at risk with rubbish. How can you justify this and how can you tell me this is acceptable? So is he right? Was this hypocrisy at its finest? Joining me now is the farmer himself, Charles Gobi. Charles, we've just been watching that little clip of you getting a little bit angry, I'd say. I mean, these are supposed to be eco-activists, aren't they? And they're essentially tipping on your, on your land. Yeah, it was very frustrating where to come across that and see the rubbish that was absolutely everywhere and the damage that was caused to the hedging. Yes, yeah, so how much rubbish exactly was there? We saw a little bit there, but was there more? Have they been doing this at other sites do you know of? Uh, no, so this is the only site that I can definitely say that they've been doing it at. Uh, this is the only one that's on our land. Uh, and yet, as you can see in the video, there's a considerable amount of uh, rubbish and I've got to give some credit to Just Stop Oil. They did contact me and they did come and clear up the mess or start to clear it up. They sent me a video last night, I think it was. Um, one of them went there and cleared up so much of it, but he said he got as much as he could fit in his vehicle and they'd have to come back to clear the rest up. Now, a lot, of our, a lot of our viewers are pretty sick and tired of seeing images of eco-activists trying to cause as much disruption as possible. It's more, more frustrating when you see that they're not being very kind to the environment themselves. Do you think a lot of this is ideology over here and then actually they're not willing to do the tiny little things that might actually help nature around us? Yeah, I, I think sometimes there is a case of that you, you become that focused on the big picture that you actually miss some of the things that you can do every day and far more easily. Um, so, I, I mean, for, for me, that yeah, they, they, they've left a mess there. They have just been blinkered into looking at doing their specific task and just sticking to that one thing where I think, they, they could work with the public, they could work with farmers and say, OK, fair enough, if you don't want to really follow what we stand for, there are other things you can do. I mean, I've suggested to them that, you know, you just got to look at what we do as farmers. We're producing some of the most environmentally and sustainably, you know, quality food, the high standards in the world. So why not just support local farmers and buy British local produce? That's going to reduce carbon footprint straight away farm animals because they're not going to be very in favor of that are they um I, I, you know I, I couldn't answer that i, I wouldn't say as they're um anti-livestock production or not there certainly are some groups out there that are um and I, i'd happily talk to them about it and debate it because without our livestock production we are going to be more reliant if anything on fossil fuels and artificial fertilizers the livestock production is a real key part of keeping our soil health and soil sustainability, which is helping us to, you know, produce crops and grow food grade crops to the highest standards without using them. Now, of course, Just Stop Oil don't just uh, dump their rubbish on people's land. They also blockade roads and vandalise petrol stations. Do you take the view that the police should uh, get a little tougher on these people? 
Yeah, it, it, it's a really hard one. So I, I, I firmly believe everybody has the right to stand up mm. for what they believe in. But me personally, I, I would always stick to the letter of the law if I had to do so. Um, so it, it was very frustrating that when this was happening, they were blocking oil and fuel coming out of the Kingsbury Oil Depot. And that had a major impact, not just on the oil industry, but every small and medium business in this area, including ourselves. So for us, it happened at a critical time when we were trying to harvest crops, harvest the food for our livestock to last us all through the winter months. Now, because of that, we weren't able to get the fuel. It delayed harvest. And when we did eventually get the fuel, we were paying, well, at the time, we didn't even know what we were being charged for it. And it turned out it was around about double. So at a time when everybody's struggling financially, we've got um, fuel inflation, food, food inflation. I mean, it, it couldn't have happened at a worse time. And it's really not helped the matter of, and, at all for anybody. And um, Extinction Rebellion, I think it was, um, clambered onto tubes and trains in London and outside London, um, essentially preventing normal working people from commuting to wherever they were going for work. And it doesn't do very well for their cause, because these are just people who are needing to make money, needing to earn a living, and they're the ones who are being most, uh, most affected by these very worthy protests. Yeah, absolutely. But it, I mean, do we have, to, we have to ask the question, is it Extinction Rebellion or is it just a few idiots that are going to the extreme and actually doing their whole cause more harm than good? You're always going to get the extreme people in whatever cause, whether it's the, the, the pro-oil or the anti-oil, the pro-meat or the anti-meat debate. Uh, and it's those few loud voices that do the, you know, the most damage and are actually drowning out the, the real arguments and the real discussions. And seeing as I've got you here, you probably listened to the budget yesterday. Did you listen to it? The budget uh, uh, announcement? Yeah, caught, yes, yes, I caught some of it. Is there anything in there for farmers? Um, do you know, I, I, you know, I really can't answer that. I'm quite fearful. There's an awful lot of borrowing um, and, yeah, this this could go, you know, it could work. It could go horribly wrong. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I wish you all the best with your um, farming. We're going to go now speak to a Just Stop Oil protester, Sean Irish, who I believe is joining us on the phone right now. Now, uh, Sean, we've just seen how angry uh, uh, Charles was, or how unimpressed he was, at least, by discovering the mess left on his land. Do you think it's right that these protesters seem to be getting away with dumping rubbish? So, first thing I would say is, it was actually me in the tunnel. Uh, Dali and I have met. He met while I was in that tunnel. So, we apologise for the mess that was left behind. Obviously, in a situation like that, what happens is we get arrested, we take away as much as we can, and the police take everything else. It's the usual process. I was very happy to find out when Charles called us to go and clean up the mess, because it meant all of the stuff that was left wasted, like water, unopened bottles of water, food that could have been given to the homeless and starving, during a cost of living crisis, the police had left littered all over the place. Empty McDonald's cups, coffee cups, all these things the police had left behind. And I was thinking, God, this is disgusting. So I went back, cleaned it up. We're going again on Sunday to replant the trees. But the main thing we need to talk about is what's actually happening right now. The government is bringing through 143 new fossil fuel licenses and expeditions. You know, this is what's concerning people. This is why people like Just Stop Oil are taking action. You know, so absolutely, we'll clean up our own mess, but will the government clean up theirs? Sean, sure, you know, we, we, we need oil and we need gas, unfortunately, in order to keep our economy going. What exactly are you trying to achieve by blockading things and tunnelling in places? Uh, what, you, you essentially want there to be absolutely no oil used in this country and presumably around the world. Do you know what impact so, that would have on our economy and our standards of living? Is. We've been on your show loads of times. The demand of Just Stop Oil is that the government immediately holds all new fossil fuel licences in the UK. Of course we know that we can't stop with oil immediately. The phone I'm talking to you on was probably delivered with oil. You know, we are aware that we need it right now. The inventor of the light bulb worked by candlelight. We are talking about investing and moving forward. We cannot continue the way we are. The last time I was on Charlie's farm, it was 40 degrees and his farm was bone dry. 
It was unworkable due to the heat, and that's what we're going to see more and more of, which is why we're encouraging people to get involved with groups like Just Stop Oil to come down on the 1st of October and challenge this government on its genocidal policies that will but lead problem, us to destruction. The, the government aren't um, looking for more supply of oil and gas because they want to destroy the planet. That is not the ambition here. The problem is, is that we don't have enough supply of energy and they need to ensure that we have but energy you security know that's domestically. Not true. We have eight years of reserves. These new fossil fuel licenses will be granted to private companies. They will give no security to the British people. If France offers 50 pence more for a barrel of oil than England will, they'll sell it to France. It's not owned by the UK people. It's not guaranteed by the UK government. They are private companies, but taxpayers paying for it. Why are taxpayers subsidising billionaires while there are people who can't afford their heating, while people are going to go cold this winter? We are subsidising billionaires. Why is that fair? Why do you think that is what the UK government should be doing right now during a cost of living crisis? Well, I think what the government needs to be doing is, is to secure as much supply as possible, as quickly as possible. And every molecule of gas that we get in this country is one less that we have to import from elsewhere, often from regimes that are deeply authoritarian and often despotic. So I think if we can get it from here first, then that's the, to the that's benefit of all of us. But that's not even true, because again, they're privately owned companies. They will sell it to the highest bidder. Just because the gas is produced here doesn't mean it'll be used here. It'll be gone to whoever pays the most for it. It does not secure the British economy. It does not secure the British energy system. What we need is green renewable energy, solar power that's produced here, wind that's produced here, British jobs for British people working together to actually have a strong economy, not you privatised be, companies. You must at least be happy that the government are showing signs of wanting to liberalise planning so that you know more solar farms can be built or more wind turbines, as well as the shell gas exploration. We can do all these things at the same time. Surely that's a good sign too. You, you're talking about having your cake and eating it too. Unfortunately, fossil fuels are killing us. They might provide us some limited protection now, but I guarantee you, Charlie will not be able to continue to farm at 40 degrees every single year. His farm will wither and die unless action is taken by this government. And as you've seen in the latest energy reports, there's not a lot in there for farmers. There's no protection for farmers like Charlie. You know, it's going to get worse. It's going to continue to get worse. Mm. We're looking at the largest cost of living crisis in decades. And right now, this government is giving more taxpayers Charles. money away to billionaires. Thank you, thank you, Sean. That's why we're saying the 1st of October, 1st of October, get down to Westminster and march with us to demand the government takes action. Yeah, Charles, are you still there? I'd just like to put one of those points to you. Are you concerned about climate change, the impact it has on your land and on farming? Yeah, yeah, and, and every farmer is in the country. Uh, at the end of the day, farming and agriculture is one of the first you know, sectors that's going to feel the impact, and we already are feeling the impact of climate change. So we are looking at ways of doing things better, reducing our carbon output and being more efficient. But at the end of the day, we've got to remember that um, we have got to produce food for people as well, and people are going to want the highest quality um, the best food that they can get, but they're going to need it at a price that's affordable for everybody. Well, that's the thing. You know, we have these lofty ideas from Sean about how we need to save the world, and you're the one who's actually implementing things in your farm to try and reduce your carbon emissions. So I think that's, I think that's good, and I think there has been a little bit of hypocrisy. Thank you very much for your time, Charles, and thank you very much for your time on the phone, Sean Irish, as well. Now, we must move on. The Chancellor, of course, Kwasi Kwarteng, delivered his mini-budget in the House of Commons yesterday. The budget package included £70 billion of increased borrowing, cuts to stamp duty for home buyers, as well as a cut to 19p in the pound on income tax. That's the basic income tax rate. But is this just a budget for the rich? Joining me now to, joining me now to discuss this is the Conservative MP for East Harrow, Bob Blackman. Wow, I've just finished a very heated debate about Just Stop Oil and their antics. Um, can I just get your quick reaction on, on the budget? Do you understand that some people are thinking, oh, is this, this, the, is this just the Tories helping out their rich mates in the city? No, it's not. And I think we should be quite clear on what we've done over the past few days. Um, a lot of what was delivered on the fiscal statement, I call it budget, mini-budget, uh, on Friday was obviously pre 
uh, considered and was part of the leadership campaign that Liz Truss was running, where she promised to reverse a number of the planned increases in tax. Remember, a lot of people have been, been talking about these, for example, the national insurance, uh, which was going to go up. Now it's, it's going to, that, that increase has been cancelled. The corporation tax rates that were going to go up have been cancelled. Uh, and indeed, tax has been reduced for everyone. Um, and indeed, obviously, you, you've mentioned the reduction in the basic rate of income tax to come in from next April. The whole purpose behind this is to encourage people to earn more and keep more of what they earn uh, and then choose to spend it as they wish and then to get growth into the economy. Um, and I think one of the problems here is that this was part of the package that was promised. Uh, the first part of the package was obviously to deal with the dramatic increase in energy prices. And you know, you've just been covering the, the issues over oil protesters. Um, here, the government have said what we've done is to cap uh, energy costs for domestic customers and for businesses. The cap for uh, domestic customers is for two years. And all the help that was being provided to every single individual household across the country still continues. Now, um, so that was the first thing that had to be done. That wasn't part of the budget, but that was the first thing. So the people that obviously were finding it hardest, which are the people on the lowest incomes, have been protected already. Mm -hmm. Now the next move is to encourage growth in the economy. And as growth in the economy goes, goes up, everyone will benefit. And that's, that's the stimulation that the Chancellor has chosen to embark upon. And by the way, this isn't, this isn't a once-off. The Chancellor has a series of these measures that he's going to be introducing between now and next April to stimulate the economy so we all have more money in our pockets, yeah. choose to spend as we wish, as opposed to the government taking the money and dispensing it as they wish. Uh, yes, this, you know, this was is just a change the... of philosophy. The change of philosophy, people have to understand it's a it's quite a marked change in philosophy. It's the biggest set of tax reductions that have taken place in this country for fifty years. So yes, and uh, it was certainly a lot of people complaining that the burden of taxation was far too high. Yeah. Now we've reduced it. It was very, it's a very large mini budget, I must say. I want to ask you about yeah. some. I want to ask you something uh, about something um, that's also been uh, hitting the headlines, of course, and something that's very concerning. That's what's been going on in Leicester. Now you're a. Um, you're the MP for Harrow East, which is also a very ethnically diverse area. You have a it's lot of the Hindus. Most diverse constituency in the country. Yeah, it's yeah. The most diverse constituency. In the very country. diverse. We are very now, concerned about what's going on in Leicester. Sorry, I uh, see you've and signed. We've been taking assurance on that. I see you've signed a letter um, because you're concerned for Hindu communities in Harrow, which is in North. North London. Um, what are you concerned about? Are you worried that tensions are going to bubble uh, in your community too? Yes, I am very seriously worried. 37% um, of my population are of Hindu origin uh, and celebrate the Hindu religion. Um, on Monday, we start the Hindu festival, festival of Navaratri. That's 10 days of celebrations uh, leading up to, remarkably, uh, the, the triumph of, uh, of good over evil uh, and light over darkness, which is part and parcel of the Hindu uh, religion. These festivals, particularly Navratri, aren't conducted in temples. They're conducted in school halls, community centres, often quite small venues. And people come together from, from different sections of the Hindu community to celebrate. It's 10 nights and therefore is of concern people coming to celebrate in, in a big way. Probably more importantly than that, on the 24th of October, we have Diwali, uh, which is the eve of Hindu New Year, which is the following year, following day, 25th of October. Um, up to or about a million Hindus across this country will be visiting temples on the 25th of October. That's a really serious problem. I've just been alerted today um, to a planned demonstration um, I'm afraid from some troublemakers in Wembley, in uh, outside Ealing Road Temple tomorrow, um, where they're going to try and stir up trouble. I hope the police are going to take action to prevent this. What happened in Leicester uh, and in, uh, in Smethwick needs to be understood 
it's not local people that were involved in this. The local people get on very well together, be they from the Hindu or Muslim mm. communities or the Sikh community. It was people from outside coming in causing trouble. Mm. Um, and I, I've been assured now that Leicester police, for example, have got very strong controls. Um, the Home Secretary went to Leicester on Thursday to reassure people and also to meet the community leaders for all the main communities, all of whom are combined together. In Harrow, we have a very strong interfaith body mm. which brings together leaders of all the different communities. We don't want any trouble. We don't want to see anyone experience any trouble, but we are concerned about external people who may come in to try and cause trouble. And my message to those people is stay away. We don't want you. We get on very well between the different communities and we don't want any troublemakers coming in and causing trouble. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, Bob. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt you. We're going to have to cut the interview uh, short because we've got got the news to get to. But I do think a lot of our viewers. I think a lot of our viewers are are, are concerned that this is just one of the consequences of multiculturalism and one of the consequences of having had mass immigration at the levels it has been. That there hasn't been the time for integration to take place, and that we've essentially imported some of these sectarian issues, and that we need to have. I don't know what it is. Strong policing. Stronger integration some sort of, uh, I don't know, we need to talk more about these issues 